Uh, Peter, our next uh, speaker <laughs> no. came yes. from uh, UK. Uh, he used to work for in the Angular team for 10 years uh, and organized an Angular Connect um, conference in, in London. I, I guess that, that was when the Angular was still, still cool. <laughs> What? No, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm so mean today. Uh, yeah, but uh, nowadays he works for Cloudflare. So even though Pekka, Pekka was trying to convince that Cloudflare is not sponsoring, I, I'm, I'm getting a bit suspicious here. <laughs> but he works with Cloud, uh, Cloudflare Flare workers and has been a foolish time dad for for past 20 years for his kids. And you yeah. sure it's good? Yeah. Thanks Let's for that. Let's give it to because, Peter. Hey. Hello, everyone. Let's hope that it all holds together. Um, <clears throat> right, so uh, thanks to Pekka. That was a really good introduction to Edge. And um, that saves me having to waste all your time with sort of going over lots of the same stuff. So I'm going to dive straight in. But first of all, I'd just uh, like to say thank you to the organizers of this conference because... Um, I can't remember whether Thule actually mentioned it, but I also used to organize uh, Angular Connect. This is when you said it was lazy. Uh, uh, not lazy. Uh, Angular wasn't cool anymore. Um, and I know how hard it is to organize these kind of conferences and how stressful it is. And they're all looking really chill, even though I know there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. So, um, so well done to everyone there. And um, I love the atmosphere. It's really nice and chill. Uh, so now I'm at Cloudflare. Um, and I've been working in a group called Cloudflare Workers, which Pekka mentioned a number of times. Uh, but in particular, I'm in a little research group, which is looking at how we can um, help developers build whole web apps based on top of Cloudflare Workers. So this is where we had this contention about whether uh, Edge is really serverless or whether it's not serverless. So as far as we're concerned, like you can run everything on Cloudflare Workers. You can do the data, you can do the compute, You've got your CDN caching and everything. So that's what we're aiming to move towards. And the team I've been working on has been looking at um, ways that we can leverage the edge to make your lives even better for producing better web apps. So we can, we're interacting with the front-end frameworks, but also looking at interacting with data providers and so on. Uh, and this is me running. I like running. So if anyone wants to go for a run later on today, come find me. Okay, so today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is there are three concepts that we've sort of been playing around with over the last sort of six to 12 months. Um, I'm going to kind of run through these really quickly, and probably I'll just do a really bad job of explaining it, and you won't understand what I'm talking about, but then come and find me afterwards, and I can show you more demos and stuff. But I think that we'll run out of time if I try and get into too much depth. Um, but what I wanted to start with was the motivation. Um, and... I've got this demo app here. Now, you know this, um, this feeling when you go to a website, and all you want to do is log in, right? So you, so you log into the page, and you, you're just waiting. I just want that login page. I just want to log in. Like, I don't want to do anything complicated. And like it's doing stuff in the background. It's booting up the JavaScript. Oh, finally, right, OK, now I can log in. And I can do my thing, and then I can start doing my productivity day and get on with recording my screen or whatever I want to do. Um, this, is a, this is a killer. And obviously, I massively exaggerated it there. But there's, um, you know, this actually has impact, as Pekka pointed out, for shop sites, like any, any kind of public-facing internet site where you will lose your users if you overgo over the um, latency budget that they are willing to accept. So... Um, We've been working on ways to reduce that latency, um, but particularly for really large apps. So going back to um, where we're at. So since I was working on Angular, when I first started working on Angular, most people were just hacking small jQuery apps together. They weren't very big. You mainly just like wrote the JavaScript in a text editor and uploaded it to the live website and then tried it out to see if it was working, and then it broke, and it didn't really matter because not many people were using it. But now we have got these massive apps. So, uh, you know, Google, for instance, they've got apps which have millions of lines of code with literally hundreds of developers working on them with many, many teams. And they all have to try and contribute to this huge code base. And um, in some ways, you know, we've been a victim of our own success because we end up with these massive applications. Um, and it's 
potentially going to lead to slow performance start, where you get that kind of slow boot up time, which will kill your um, user experience. But also, there are a whole load of additional problems for the teams themselves. You know, if you've got 10, 20 teams trying to contribute to a code base, how do you make sure that they can actually keep moving forward and um, develop features and deploy features without being tied to the fates of all of the other teams? And what happens if your team deploys a bug, and then after about 12 hours, you realize there's this bug, but by then, the other teams have like, landed 20 features as well. You can't just like uh, easily just roll back your feature, because it might be that they're now depending upon it, and suddenly all your feet. There's this uh, blog post I can link to called like, uh, tying your fates together. And basically, you're just stuffed if, you, if you've got lots of people trying to contribute to the same code base. So this is, the this is where we're at for lots of companies out there. Um, Interestingly, the nice diagrams have not appeared. But never mind, we'll move. Sorry? There it is, yeah. So I knew I had some pretty pictures to just uh, illustrate what we're doing. So um, one of the things that we can do in the front end is uh, use things like server-side rendering, caching the results, trying to um, make it so that the initial page load is fast so we don't get that slow boot up time that I just demonstrated at the beginning. Um, but you still then have latency problems, like if you are using the cloud and you're on the wrong side of the world, you can still get slow startup times. Um, but then, oh, and also I was going to say, and then what lots of companies do is that they break up their app into smaller apps, basically maybe by route or by view. So as you move from one part of the app to another, you're really just bootstrapping a new app. And that's where like, the server-side rendering can help, because um, if you've just got a client-side app and then you move to a new client-side app, then you have to incur the cost of the boot-up time again and again every time you navigate around. Um, but then there are other kinds of problems, which is, and I, I mentioned earlier I like running. So this is one of my favorite one, rev websites, Runderware. Um, so all my underwear that I'm running in uh, comes from here. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them. Um, so you can imagine, like if you had a really big site uh, with lots of sort of visual elements, maybe all of these different pieces are owned by different teams, and they would like to deploy their piece of the application independently as well. You know, like you've got the marketing people would want to deploy their bit of the site, um, and again, this drags you back into that kind of monolithic nature. And so, how do we deal with this? You can't just break your app and pin to lots of small apps. You have to think a different approach. So uh, one thing that's been started to tout around recently is this idea of micro front ends. So micro front ends are building on a concept that's been around in the back end for a long time called microservices, where you split up your big monolithic uh, application into small pieces, which have well-defined interfaces between each other. Um, that means that you can decouple uh, the people who are building each of these microservices, or micro front ends in this case. Um, but obviously, you then get an overhead of how do you then get those things to interact? How do you make sure that your deployments are consistent and so on? Um, uh, so this is a, an area that we think, and there we go, we get the diagram. Um, and this is a, like an, an area that we think is something that we should try and move towards, and that maybe the edge computing approach and Cloudflare workers, which is what I work in, um, can actually help here. Um, so. People have been uh, are trying to approach this micro front ends uh, technique, but using a client side approach. So what they do is they break up their client side app into modules, maybe use module federation, um, and then lazy load bits of the app at, at runtime as they're needed. Um, but they still have some problems with this. So um, you can potentially still have this slow boot up time because you're waiting on the client side stuff to work. Um, uh, when you're using things like module, fed module federation, you have to decide at build time exactly how you're going to break up these modules uh, and how they're going to be shared. But so that sometimes means that you end up downloading code that's not actually going to be used to the browser because you don't quite know exactly how it's going to work. And maybe if you were yet, uh, here yesterday listening to Mishko Hevery's talks about Quick, he has lots of ideas about how you can be more intelligent about how you break that stuff up and deploy it. Um, so I think that there's work going on there. But um, I think also uh, the whole approach of just doing it client side is not necessarily the right one to do. Um, so uh, yeah, this is kind of like where we're at. We might we might have some solutions here, but it's not quite 100% right. So what we did was we tried to take a different approach. 
And we said, how about if we actually break up the application, like the visible application, into small blocks, and each one is its own app, which is its own server-side rendered app, and then we patch them all back together at the request time. So rather than doing it on the client, we can do it in the, at the edge, and we'll actually render all the pieces and then patch them back together and then serve them up to the browser in one go. So then the browser receives HTML that's server-side rendered and ready to go, so you don't get that boot-up latency. But also, you get this composability because each of the actual pieces is being deployed to its own, in our case, Cloudflare worker, but it could be any uh, server-side endpoint. This means that people can then deploy individually to those different places. They're not tied to each other. They don't have that uh, same um, fate tying. So how would this actually look? So um, this is an idea of what our architecture looks like. So these um, diagram, these um, little circles with these icons in, uh, this is the icon for a Cloudflare worker. So whenever you see one of those, you can imagine that piece of JavaScript that Peck had showed earlier, which was a fetch handler, you do some JavaScript, and then you return a response. So each of these circles is doing exactly that. So what happens is the, um, the request comes in from the browser. This main worker then delegates out to a bunch of um, fragments or micro front ends which go off and do their own bit of work. And so this header worker will go and generate some HTML using server-side rendering. Similarly, the body will do so, but actually the body is also delegating down. So you can see how this is composing. And then finally, as these request responses come back, each of these workers will then patch the response back together and stream it down to the next worker up the tree. And then finally, the response gets streamed down to the end user. Um, so uh, this architecture we call a fragment architecture. And each of these workers is basically what we call a fragment. So it's just a label that we've attached to it to help explain in our brains what's going on. Um, so I've got a little demo. Hopefully, I can bring it up. So here's, this is, so this architecture here has been built into this, um, this Cloud Gallery demo. You can go and play with this for yourself. It's at cloudgallery.webexperiments.workers.dev. And the code's all open source, so you can go and play around with it. Um, so this is a really simple app. All it does is it just shows a, a whole load of um, images, and you can filter it by, you know, like, cloudy. There we go or and they dark. So the filtering is a little JavaScript um, application. Uh, the header is an application. If I click Show Steams, you can see where each of these micro front ends are. So each of these boxes is its own application. It's completely independent of the others. And you can even see that by if I go and click on Body and open that up, it's its own web app. So this is the, this is the um, body micro front end. It's existing all on its own, and it's totally functional. I can still go in here and you know, do vivid, and it still works. So it exists in its own place, but it also ex can exist in the context of, of another fragment. And um, to give you a sense of how um, this works, if I put a little bit of artificial delay into how quickly the images get pulled down, so that's, the, that's this gallery section. And if I reload this without, oh, with the duck. You can see now that we've got like a two second delay before each image appears. So it's very, very slow now. But what you'll see is that while it's still loading those images, this filter app, the, the filter segment is still actually operational. So even though the, the gallery fragment is still streaming down its HTML, the filter element has actually been up and running from the beginning. And so I can start interacting, and I can get a user experience benefit by interacting with the website while there's other stuff still coming down from the server. And so this is one of the benefits from, of this micro front end approach, is that because each of these elements is its own um, app, they're in, they can become interactive independent of all the other ones. And you can imagine in, say, a shop front where you might have the login bits or the 
the basket, for instance, which comes down early, and you might still be downloading all the comments or reviews about a product, and they can still go and interact with the basket even though there's stuff going on behind the scene, like further down the page. Obviously, this is super simple, but you can go and play with this and get a sense of how this works. Um, so some of the things that we think you could like build on top of this, which we haven't actually built into this um, demo, uh, are things like caching. So uh, there we go. So you can see like we could actually cache the output of some of these um, workers, especially the ones that are more static. So for instance, like the header, just totally static. It's just a bunch of HTML. We still have it as a, as a web app that's going to be server-side rendered. But we know it's very rarely going to change. It's only going to change when we upload a new version of the app. So we could put some really heavy caching on that one. So this worker here never actually gets executed very often. Like it literally just, you hit the worker and it just returns the cache response. You're not wasting cycles, burning um, energy, wasting cost of actually running your serverless function because it's already done its job and it can just download its results. And because each of these is just going to, um, uh, pull in the responses from the delegated workers, then that can speed up the whole process. So the user ends up getting a response much faster than it would have done otherwise. Um, one of the cool things about this is that these caches are local to the edge, to wherever the user is. So you could actually cache very like geographic specific versions of a cache. Like if you've got um, translated versions, you could cache those in the relevant country. You could even go so far as to say, well, look, uh, this header is always going to show something that's very specific to the user, and we could cache all the different users in that location, maybe. And so when, when a user comes in, they just get their version really quickly, or we could have some subset of like heavy users who are going to just get a cache version. So there's some really interesting things that we can do with caching here. And obviously, then we could bust the cache based on if we've uploaded new um, items to the catalog of the shop, then it would bust the cache of the, of the list of catalogs, and so you'd get those updated. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was like each of these workers is totally independently deployable. So if I wanted to change the, the way that the logic in the filter worker works, I can change that logic. I can upload and deploy the filter worker, and I don't have to deploy any of the others, and everything just immediately picks up the new version of the filter, and everything just carries on as though, uh, as though you deployed the whole app in one go. So each team can then deploy their, at their own cadence. And if there's a bug in the filter, they can just roll back that filter to the previous version, and it removes it. And the other uh, workers are not impacted. Um, the other cool thing about using server-side rendering is that you can avoid having to, oh, yeah. you can avoid having to um, lock yourself into a particular front-end framework, because um, for instance, here I've just hypothetically suggested that the, the header could be a React component, uh, com like application. The body could be a Quick comp application, um, and so you can imagine how, like, if you're integrating multiple teams which are working with different technologies, it's potentially easier to do it this way. And again, it's this idea of not tying in the fates of all of the teams to one way of doing things. Um, it could be that the body is written with one version of Quick, but the foot is written with another version because that team hasn't like caught up at the moment. Um, and as long as the uh, the HTML can be patched together and the uh, runtime uh, code that gets downloaded can run okay, then there's no reason why you can't have this kind of architecture for a very diverse um, approach. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note here is that uh, these dotted lines are kind of like routes. So these, these are three different views. And of course, what would happen is that the body worker would select which of these three workers it needs to delegate to based on the, the request that's coming in. So again, you don't need to, like, if there's code in, if we're just looking at the profile, we don't need to run or download any of the blog and the gallery code. Whereas if you're doing all this like client side, you have to bring everything down and then run it locally on the browser. So that delays things. But obviously, this is like an idealistic solution. Like, how would you do this in practice if you've already got some huge monolithic app which you are trying to migrate uh, or, or get some benefits from this fragment architecture? So then we started thinking about, well, how could you actually create some kind of incremental migration approach? Um, because obviously, just stopping and rewriting a million lines of code is not going to be a very uh, pleasant job. Um, so what we came up with was this uh, concept uh, called 
piercing. And the idea here is that you can take a small section of your legacy app, convert it to a fragment, so a server-side rendered fragment, and inject it into your legacy client-side app. So let's, oh, sorry. I need to keep looking. Shout to me if there doesn't, if there looks like there's a big gap and there's no image. Um, so in this case, there's a, the, we saw the productivity suite earlier, and this login fragment is the, is the piece that we'd like to see really quickly. Even though we're not going to rewrite the whole app, we're just going to rewrite the login component so that it's a, its own fragment. And then we've written this uh, demo which will allow you to show the, the login fragment immediately while the actual main app is booting in the background. And then um, once the main app boots, we then move the fragment into the right place in the DOM inside the client side code, which is what the piercing is. We're basically piercing the fragment back into the legacy code at the right place. So again, we've got a little demo of this. Oh, by the way, I wanted to point out that um, these, these approaches give you really good page insight call scores. Um, regularly, you're hitting like 90 plus for performance. Um, it depends, obviously, on your front-end framework. But like what you get from doing it this way is that the, the latency aspects of going to the cloud and back again are immediately reduced. Um, and obviously, with the caching and so on, you can speed things up. So let's go to this productivity suite. So we showed this earlier. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to make the latency five seconds. So this is what it looks like if we don't have the piercing enabled. So you basically just have to wait for the app to bootstrap. So we've got this artificial delay, which is how long the, the client-side app is bootstrapping. Um, and again, so here you can see this is the login fragment. So if I now enable piercing, and I, re and I refresh again, then what you see is the login fragment is there instantaneously while we still have to wait the five seconds for the main app to boot up. And the cool thing about this is that because the login fragment is its own application, it's interactive instant immediate immediately. So I can go in here and start interacting, and you can see that it's doing stuff. Basically, we've just hacked it so that the password appears to increase when you're typing in, but it shows that there's interactivity. So I can start typing in, the, the background app is still booting. Uh, the, literally, the background app doesn't even exist at this stage. Um, and what's really cool is that if I start typing and then hit login, it initiates the login, but it still has to wait for the background app to finish booting. And then once it finishes, then it sends the message to the main app saying, OK, now log in. Cool. So we've got this sort of message bus situation going on where each of these fragments is able to communicate with the other ones at runtime through a message bus, which basically lives at the document level. Uh, and just to demonstrate, um, so this is what, oh, that actually appeared first time. So this is what the architecture of this looks like. So what we've got is um, each of these fragments is its own worker, similar to the fragment architecture earlier. But now what we've got up here is we've got a client-side React app. So that there's no worker here because this is just static assets that we've uploaded to Cloudflare. And then when the user comes in and makes a request, it hits this worker that we've called the piercing gateway. And the, this gateway will do two things. First of all, it will start downloading the assets for the, the client-side app. But secondly, it works out what route you're on. And it will go and actually um, ask the appropriate fragments to render themselves. And then it will inject those into the HTML stream uh, so that it can appear immediately. Um, how do I get back to it? There we go. Um, what's cool about this, and I should show you, see on the diagram, each of our fragments is actually using a like different, different framework. So we've got, just for Ryan, we've got the SolidJS going in there. If Mish goes in the room, we've got some Quick, and we've got some React. So if I go back to the demo, We've now logged in, and we've got this to-do list. And the list picker fragment, I think, was uh, is this to-do list one here. So the list picker fragment is written with Quick, but the actual to-do body is actually the classic to-do MVC on React. So this bit down here is a React app. This bit up here is a is a is a Quick app. And these two, you can see, are um, you can see that these things down here. This is changing. 
based on the, the interaction between the two fragments. So the, the list picker fragment is picking up an event that you've moved from one place to another, and then the, uh, it sends a message through the message bus to the to-dos fragment to say, oh, now you need to display this, this list, to-dos list. Um, and then we've got the, the classic solid JS uh, news view. And the whole of this piercing stuff still works. So if I refresh now, we're logged in. So when I refresh, you'll see the news fragment appears instantaneously because it's its own fragment. And then we wait five seconds, and then the rest of the legacy app boots in the background. So again, the user can start to interact. Look, I can start paging through even while the, um, the, the legacy app is building. So you can imagine how you've got this really big app, and you just choose one high-value part of the app that would benefit from having a much better user interaction. And you could then just start to build that particular piece and integrate it back into your, into your tooling. Um, I'm running long on time, so I'm just going to quick jump through. But we, if you want to find out more about the details of how this works and look at the code, I'm really happy to walk through it with you later. Um, so the last item that we talked about, or that I listed, was this thing called reframing. We haven't actually done a blog post about this one yet, and it's kind of still in early days. But um, one of the things about micro front ends is that if you've got a really big app and you're moving from one view to another, you're constantly loading in this new code to accommodate that micro front end. And then when you move on to somewhere else, it's, that stays in memory, right? So slowly over time, you start building up more and more memory usage in your browser. What you really want is as you move from one place to another, if there's a micro front end that's no longer used, you want to unload it from memory. And that's quite hard to do with JavaScript. Um, but we came up with this quite cool approach, which is basically uh, making use of iframes to work as a sandbox to hide the code in, and so then you can kill the iframe, and it unloads all that code. But you can't just use iframes like in situ, because they lock you into a very small piece of the page. And actually, often you want to be able to update the UI across the whole page, and not just stuck inside an iframe. So we do this patching where you run the code in the iframe, but it actually interacts with the DOM in the main document. And again, I can talk through that uh, at some depth, if you like. But this is kind of like a really high-level sense of what it looks like. So this is your classic monolith. You download the whole app. Uh, there's a single DOM, and all of the code is running in a single context. And there's nothing you can do to, to like unload code at this point. Um, if you move to our fragment architecture, you'll see that there's, there are two workers that generate the, um, the fragment and the main app. And they get combined at the same in uh, runtime into the main window, but again, you've only got a single context. You've loaded everything into the Windows um, context, the iframe, uh, the frame. But with this reframed approach, what happens is, yeah, the um, the fragment actually gets loaded into an iframe, which has its own memory uh, context. The main app is in the main app uh, context, and so when they get combined together, you've got these two as totally separate. So then, when you move on. And the, and the fragment gets deleted from the window, it can also then delete all of the code and all the memory that was associated with it. So you get um, a, a much more stable uh, memory usage. So this is what we actually found from our demo, and the terrible, terrible uh, contrast, I'm sorry. But you, generally, what you're going to see is a, is a step, like a, a staircase going up. So every time we're moving from one route to another, we're slowly uh, adding more and more memory to the usage. Then if you start using this reframing approach, you can, oh, you can see that you get a little bump, but then as you move on to the new one, it stabilizes back down again. So over time, you're just keeping a similar amount of memory usage in your app, which again, for these really massive, long-running, um, monolithic type apps that we've been building recently, is really helpful. So that was a, a, a rocket pass through all these three ideas. There are blog posts about them. Um, which you can go and read up on the Cloudflare website. Um, we've also got a, a Discord channel where you can come and chat to us, um, and there's some other articles. I'll upload this um, presentation so you can go and find the links directly yourselves. Um, but uh, while this stuff is not clearly not production, it's not even sort of like usable in a kind of let's go and try out this just for a bit of fun. It's very much proof of concept stuff. But I think hopefully it will entice you into this world of uh, micro front ends and using Edge to actually do the work to generate the, uh, the SSR uh, output. 
And uh, Igor, Daria, and James and I are on this little team which are building this stuff. We'll be really happy to talk to anyone who's interested in trying out, got views on it, think that it's a load of rubbish. Definitely welcome any kind of feedback about that. So um, I think we've got a little bit of time for some Q&A. So I think Pekka and I are going to come back on the stage and basically just see if you've got any questions. Thank <laughs> you.